morning. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, preach. And this mic, like this. It's good. It's good to be with all of you this morning. If you would get out your Bibles and open up to Matthew chapter twenty-four. Matthew chapter twenty-four. A couple things as you find that passage, and we uh, get situated here to get started. Um, the saints from uh, Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, send their greetings, and it's always a good thing to be here. And, and to preach and to fellowship with the saints. Unfortunately, this year, my wife and I are going to have to leave when we're done here. Uh, we're trying to sell our house in Michigan and move closer to our assembly building, and uh, there's some things going on that I've got to address with respect to trying to move and so forth. So we're going to have to uh, depart when we're done here, but uh, we, we wish we could stay longer and uh, enjoy your company. A couple of things just uh, from the ministry there in Grand Rapids, uh, there are two new booklets that I've put together since last year when I was here. One is the Apocrypha in the King James Bible. It deals with uh, why the Apocrypha was included and some things about the history of the Apocrypha. I know some people have always seem to have questions about that, why the King James translators included it. We try to address that issue. And then another one is, uh, did Paul know the mystery when he wrote Romans? And that's a, a technical investigation into some things about some teachings of Bollinger and so forth. Also, I'd just like to mention a few other things quickly. October 18th through the 20th at Grace Life Bible Church in Michigan, we're going to be having a Bible conference on the Gospels Project. We're going to look at all the different Gospels, Gospel of the Kingdom, Gospel of God, Gospel of Christ, uncircumcision, circumcision, and so forth, and try to define what those were, who was preaching them, and, and so on. And uh, Brother Dave Reed's going to come up for that. Also, the Grace History Project, uh, the church history lessons, those are online if you're interested in those. I did interview Pastor Jordan for four hours uh, last month. He came up to our house, and I got a recording of that, and I'm processing that. And so I'm going to include within that, that, that class and that course of study the history of, of us and uh, how Grace School of Bible came to be and how the Grace Life Doctrines were, were uh, um, realized and came to be believed and lastly, very quickly, uh, there's a gentleman right here, Jerry Halston. He's uh, from, from the area of Hoffman States. He was my uh, Sunday school teacher when I was a child at, uh, Stream, in Streamwood at Grace Bible Church in Streamwood, Illinois. He has taken a sort of a, a, um, a, upon himself to do some things with J.C. O'Hare, and he has over here on the table by where my books are at some, some material, some literature, that he wants you to look at, peruse, and there's some things they can take there as well if you're interested in that. All right, Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 34. Let me just read the verse, and then I'll tell you what the uh, topic is here right now. Matthew chapter 24, verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for the saints that have gathered here this morning to hear your word preached. We pray that there would be understanding and edification that would result from our time together. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. The subject that I've been given with respect to Matthew 24, 34 is the following. Address the preterist claim that all prophecy was fulfilled in the first century and that we are the Israel of God. Okay? And I'll explain what all that means as we go through here. But I just want you to look at the verse. Verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation, now notice what it says, shall not what? Pass, what's the next word? Till all these things be fulfilled. Now, if you just read that, is it saying and suggesting that the people, the audience to whom Christ is speaking, that they are not going to die and pass away until the things that he's been speaking to them about in the passage come, come to pass and are fulfilled? Okay. Well, what is he talking about here? What are some of these things that, the, the things that are mentioned in verse 34 when he says, till all these things be fulfilled, there's a context here that he's discussing. If you would go back to, up in the passage, go to verse 4, quick. Verse 4, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that... Uh, but see that thou be not troubled, for all these things, notice, must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And all, notice what he says, all these things are the beginning of what? Now you look at that and you say, that's some bad stuff. Pestilence, earthquake, sorrow, famine, all these things, war going on. And Christ says, hey, when you see these things, you need to understand this is just the what? This is just the beginning. And then you drop down to verse 15, and he says, 
When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by the prophet Daniel, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Well, what does the book of Daniel chapter 9 tell you about when the abomination of desolation occurs? It says that it occurs in the midst of what? In the week. So understand what Christ is doing. In verses 4 through 8, he's telling them what the beginning of sorrows are going to be. And then in verse 15, he goes to the middle of the tribulation and he says, hey, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's going to be a, a signal or a marker assigned to you that you guys need to get out, okay? And so he starts with the beginning of sorrows and then he comes through and he talks to them about the middle and what's going to happen in the, the midst of the week or in the middle of the tribulation by talking to them about the abomination of desolation and that being fulfilled when they see that occur according to Daniel 9.27. And then if you drop down to verse... We obviously don't have time to teach all this in great detail. We'll never get to um, the points we want to make. Look at verse 29. Immediately when? After what? The tribulation of those days shall the, sh shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and there shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, notice, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and what? Now understand, the Olivet Discourse here in, in, in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus Ask, he's answering a question that they have, in fact. If you go back to verse 3, it says, And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. The disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of what? So he, he tells them the beginning of sorrows. He says, Look, here's what's going to happen first. This is going to be a signal. These are the beginning of sorrows. But when you see these things happen, you need to understand that they must come to pass. But the end is what? It's not yet. Then he goes in verse 15 and following, and he talks about the abomination of desolation, which we know from Daniel 9, 27, happens in the middle of the week. And then at the end of the passage, in verses 29 and following, he describes the second coming of the Lord back to earth in, in, in power there, verse 31, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other, and then you get to verse 34, our text verse, and he says, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be what? Well, what things is he talking about? He's talking about the beginning of sorrows. He's talking about the abomination of desolation. He's talking about the second coming of the Lord back to earth. And he says, listen, you guys aren't going to die. This generation is not going to pass until all these things are what? Fulfilled. So now I have a couple questions. Were they fulfilled? Why not? Now, I know you're going to jump. Well, you're going to go right to the answer that we're going to get to in the end. But I don't want you to do that yet. I just want you to think through this with me, okay? <laughs> Why not? Okay? Is, does Jesus meet, how many things Jesus knows what he's talking about? <laughs> if you think he knows what he's talking about, and you can read there that he says, listen, you guys, this generation that he's been addressing now for almost three years, he's saying to them, you're not going to die, you're not going to pass until these things are what? Fulfilled. Now, do you, do you see the problem there? If you don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you can look and know that those things haven't come to pass yet, then does it look very much like Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about? Okay. And if Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about, then a critic of the Word of God, a critic of the Scripture that doesn't want to believe it's the Word of God will come here and say, see, the Bible's not inspired because Jesus said these things would come to pass before this generation dies, but the generation died and the things didn't yet what? Come to pass. Therefore, the Bible is unreliable, it's untrustworthy, it's not inspired, and you shouldn't believe it. And you see, I hope, from that sort of framing of the, the, the discussion, why we got to have a good answer for what's going on here, okay? Now, one of the answers that has been offered in church history is to teach that everything in this passage is already fulfilled, okay? That the beginning of sorrows, the abomination of desolation, the return of the Lord back to earth bodily, the second coming, that all the things Jesus is talking about in the passage have already been fulfilled and that they were fulfilled in 70 A.D. 
with the destruction of Jerusalem at the hand of the Romans. Okay? This belief, folks, is called preterism. Okay? It's called preterism. And it's a belief, it's a doctrine that is out there that says that everything that is going on here that is being discussed in Matthew 24 has already been fulfilled and that it was fulfilled in 70 A.D. with the destruction of the temple. And I want to say to you, when you read the preterist literature, one of the things that comes up over and over and over again is that the preterists believe that this interpretation is a defense of the inspiration of the Bible because it explains what the verse is saying. And so they're holding... One of the reasons why preterism is attractive to some people who don't understand about right division is because they view it as a way of maintaining the integrity of the Bible. In this case, the generation not passing to all these things be fulfilled. And the way they answer that is to say, well, they were all fulfilled when? In 70 AD, before the generation he's speaking to did what? Died and passed away. Okay? So... To talk about the preterist claims, I want to look at three points this morning. The first, I want to talk a little bit more about what is preterism. The second, I want to talk to you about <coughs> excuse me, when and why preterism was taught in church history. And then we want to look at the scriptural answer to preterism as the third point. So let's look at the first point, what is preterism? The title preterism, folks, is derived from the Latin word preterer, which means past. Okay, so preterism is the belief that everything in the Bible has had a past what? Fulfillment. It's already occurred. It's already taking place. There is nothing left that is unfulfilled, at least in, in, in strict preterism. It claims, preterism claims that all Bible prophecies, including the events described by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse here and by John in the book of Revelation, have all already been fulfilled okay now as with all sort of unsound views or heresies or what have you there are always different degrees of which people are willing to go to if you study preterism there are two essentially two types of preterism the first one is called moderate preterism all right let me tell you what that is moderate preterism holds that the resurrection and the second coming are future okay so they say that the resurrection and the second coming are future, but that all of the other prophecies made in Matthew 24 and 25 and in Revelation chapter 6 through 18, so again, that's Matthew 24 and 25 and Revelation 6 through 18, that all of those prophecies have been fulfilled in the first century by 70 A.D. And there's only two things that remain yet unfulfilled, which would be, as I said, the... Um, uh, what did I say? The resurrection, the first resurrection, and the second coming. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're a preterist, that's not going to work because all of those events are also included in Matthew 24 as said that they're going to come to be fulfilled before the generation what? Passes. So that's, we're not going to deal with moderate preterists here. We're going to deal with the second type, and that is extreme or full preterism. What this position maintains is that all New Testament predictions are past, including those about the first resurrection and the second coming. And again, likewise, they all occurred during the first century. So an extreme or full preterist is going to say that every single Bible prophecy in the Scriptures have already been fulfilled, they have already come to pass by the time that the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., okay? Now, theologically speaking, preterism stands in direct contrast with what is called futurism, okay? Now, if preterism is, is, if preterer means past, and preterism is the belief that all prophecy had its fulfillment in the past, what would futurism be? Futurism would be that, by and large, everything in Matthew 24 and 25 awaits a yet future what? fulfillment okay that the events recorded there have not yet come to pass and so there's a tension within theology between the preterists that want to say that it was all fulfilled in 70 a.d and the futurists that will say no these things have not yet come to pass and they await a yet future fulfillment futurists now so we as great uh, mid-acts pauline dispensationalists and so forth what's taught to you in great school of bible is not preterism it's what it's futurism 
Now, I don't, I'm not going to get into all the different types of futurists because there are different people out there and, and, and what they say and so forth. That's not what we're going to do this morning. But you need to understand that we generally, we, but we are, as mid-Acts Pauline dispensationalists, listening to what Brother Bruchet was talking about last night, we are futurists. We believe that everything from here, the 70th week of Daniel on, has not yet what? It has not yet occurred, okay? And will not occur, and not only will not occur, cannot occur until God's purpose with the church, the body of Christ here, is complete and the church is taken out of the way, raptured and so forth, like we were looking at last night. Now, the preterists have a few other proof texts that they want to use. Get two passages. Get Matthew 10 in one hand and Matthew 16 in the other. Matthew 10 and Matthew 16. Now, I'll tell you right now that the infer- my source on preterism is the International Preterist Association. So there is an International Preterist Association. Matthew 10, look at verse 23. Matthew 10, verse 23. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, you shall not have gone over all the cities of Israel till what? The Son of Man become. So you see the tension again in that verse. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he talks about, be, he, he sends them out and he tells them to, you know, to go to Jerusalem and Judea and then where? Into the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus tells them here in Matthew 10, after he commissions the 12 apostles and sends them out, he goes, you guys aren't, at, you're not going to have been able to cover all the cities here in Jerusalem until what? Well, what's it say? Until the Son of Man be what? Therefore, in order for the Bible to retain its integrity, the preterists will argue, that had to, th- these things have all already had to have been what? Fulfilled and come to pass, or else the Bible is untrustworthy and unreliable and so on. The other verse that they like is coming to Matthew 16, and look at verse 27. I should have told you to mark these. Uh, Matthew 16, look at verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of His Father with His angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verse 28, Verily I say unto you, there shall, not, there shall be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in what? His kingdom. So I, I hope that you see the similarities between these, these three passages. Okay, They're all saying that there's going to be folks that are alive in that generation of Israel that are not going to die that are not going to pass away until they see Christ come and establish and set up the kingdom. Now, as my time is fleeing from me, I'm not going to waste any more time telling you what the preterists believe. I think you get it at this point. I want to move on into my second point, which is when and why was preterism taught in church history? You have to understand, folks, that during the Protestant Revolution or the Protestant Reformation, the Protestants had a belief that was very common that the Pope was the Antichrist. Okay, that the Pope, that the papacy, that the office of the papacy was the fulfillment of the passages in the book of Revelation about the beast and that 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 that, that was the um, the fulfillment of those things was I'm sorry, that the Pope or and or the office of the papacy were the beast and the Antichrist. Now, if you're familiar with church history, you know that the Catholics responded to the reformers through what is called the counter reformation. Okay. And one of the main elements of the Counter-Reformation is the establishment of a group known as the Jesuits. How many have heard of the Jesuits? The Jesuits are the Society of Jesus. And what the Jesuit monks tried to do is they tried to come up with ways to escape this teaching that the Pope was the Antichrist. Well, think about it. What's one way to escape that teaching? To say that it was all what? It's already been happened. It's already fulfilled. And so one of the major movements of the Jesuits, preterism, folks, in its modern form was first articulated by a guy named Elkazer who lived between 1554 and 1613 who was a Jesuit monk. And he articulates it as an answer to the Protestant teaching that the Pope or the papacy 
was the beast or the Antichrist. And so the Catholics are trying to escape here the, cat, the, 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 reform, the teaching of the Reformers that the Pope or the papacy is the fulfillment of that. And one of the ways they're doing that is to say, well, everything was already fulfilled when? 70 AD. Now, I should tell you, and I'm, we don't have time to get into it, Brother Tom's study last night on the rapture was very good. Another allege, they also will allege, some people, is an attack on the pre-tribulation rapture that the rapture doctrine was first articulated by Jesuit monks. Okay? And the reason they're doing that is to, is to ridicule that Protestant doctrine and trying to attach a Catholic origin to it and thereby trying to discredit the teaching of the rapture. Okay? Everybody with that? Now, if you want to know more about that, in the Church History Project, there are about six lessons where I go all through the history of rapture doctrine teaching and what is going on. But I, we don't have time to get into that. So preterists, though, will attempt to cry foul and say, well, we have, there are people in church history before the time of the Jesuits that believe these things. You can find, folks, there are two sixth century uh, commentaries on the book of Revelation where there are different little pieces of what the preterists believe, but by and large, in its modern manifestation, it does originate with this Jesuit monk, Alcazar, uh, who first articulated the idea as part of the, the Catholic Counter-Reformation. So, as we saw earlier, preterism, moving on to my third point where I want to spend the most of my time, preterism is essentially based upon how one understands these three verses in Matthew, okay? Matthew 10, he tells the apostles, you won't have gone over all the cities of Jerusalem, or I'm sorry, of, of Israel, till you see the Son of Man what? Come. Matthew 16, he says that there are members in that generation that shall not pass until they see Christ coming in his kingdom. Matthew 24, after the description of the beginning of sorrows, the abomination of desolation, and the return of the Lord, he says, this generation shall not pass until you see all these things be fulfilled. So I want to talk about this. What is the answer to this? How, does, how should we understand this? Um, and to do that, I want you to go um, get two passages, get Matthew 3 and get Mark 1. Matthew chapter 3 and Mark 1. Matthew chapter 3 and Mark 1. Get Matthew, let's look at Matthew quick first. And don't, don't leave something in this because we will flip back and look at something in chapter 4 here in a minute. So, chapter 16, we read the verse. He says, there are people standing here that will not die or shall not taste death until they see Christ or the Son of Man coming in his what? In his kingdom. Okay? What is John teaching? Matthew 3, verse 2. Verse 1, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is what? Now, beginning with the testimony of John the Baptist in the life of the nation of Israel, you begin to have the announcement here that the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. And there's an entire generation now in Israel that is going to hear this message preached. They're going to hear it preached first by John the Baptist, second by the Lord himself. Go to chapter 4. You'll see Jesus preaches the exact same thing. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is what? Well, who, who preached that before him? John, that exact thing. If you go to verse 23, it defines that as the gospel of the kingdom. And Jesus went all about Galilee, teaching and preaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of what? The kingdom. So, there, go to Mark chapter 1. So there's going to be an entire generation in Israel now, beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist, extended through the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and ultimately through the 12 apostles that he's going to commission in Matthew 10. He tells them to do the same thing. That is hearing a message, and the message that they are hearing is that the kingdom of heaven is what? Now what does it mean when it says it's at hand? It means it's near, right? My notes are at hand. I reach out and I pick them up. They're at hand. They're near, okay? Mark chapter 1, look at verse 14. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Look at what it says. Now, after that, John was put into prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. What are the first two words of verse 15? 
and saying. So verse 14 tells you that he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Verse 15 tells you what he's saying while he's preaching that. And what is he saying? It says, and saying, watch, there's three things here. The time, number one, is what? Fulfilled. Number two, and the kingdom of God is what? At hand. Three, repent ye and do what? Now, why is the kingdom of God at hand or near in, that, in those verses? Because the time is what? Fulfilled. So there's something going on here prophetically that is governing time. Okay? So we've reached a point beginning with the ministry of John the Baptist in the prophetic time calendar of God that the time had arrived, the time was right, the time had been fulfilled for the kingdom to be announced as what? As at hand. And John the Baptist goes out there and he starts doing that. Jesus goes out and does the same thing and the 12 apostles go out and are going to preach this, that same gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. So the announcement here that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand is being governed, folks, by Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks in Daniel 9. According to Daniel's prophecy, the time truly was at hand. The 69th week was winding down, and Israel, think about this, Israel was within about a 10-year window here. If the, if the prophetic program is not interrupted, you know that the tribulation is how long? Seven years. Jesus Christ's earthly ministry is how long? Three years. So they are within literally a, time, a roughly a 10-year time frame, give or take, before everything that was said back here should have been what? Fulfilled. So when he's saying the time is fulfilled, he has in mind here the prophecy that's made by Daniel back there in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 9. So think about the, come back with me to Matthew 2. Think about the wise men just for a moment. Where are the wise men from? They're from the east. Where was Israel in captivity? Babylon, which is east or west of Jerusalem? It's east. Okay, in case, in case you didn't know, you should look at the map on that. Matthew, Matthew 2, look at verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from what? The east to where? So they're from the east, and they come where? West to Jerusalem, verse 2, saying, where is he that is born what? I have a question. How did they know that? How did these wise men from the east, these, these probably pagan Gentiles, how did they know to go to Jerusalem and seek the king of the Jews at that exact, in that exact window of time that they should be looking for him that was born king of the Jews? Well, they had, back in Babylon, they had copies of what? They had copies of the Old Testament. They had copies of the book of Daniel. And they could read and understand from Daniel's prophecy that the time was fulfilled. So when they look in the sky and they see that star, they know from the Word of God that that means something and that if they want to find the king of the Jews, they need to go where? To Jerusalem and try to find him. And it makes sense to go to the capital city looking for him that is born king of the Jews. What the wise men don't know, though, is that the Scripture also said that he was going to be born where? In Bethlehem, and you can read the rest of that yourself. But the point I want you to see here is, did they know that there was a time frame in which he should be born? And they went seeking him. Come to uh, Rodney talked about this a little bit yesterday. Go over, to, go over to Luke 19. The prophecy of the 70 weeks, Rodney said he couldn't even talk about the whole verse because he didn't have time, and I, I agree with him. But the prophecy of the 70 weeks, it it's explicitly says that they're determined upon my people and upon thy holy what? City. And so when Jesus rides into Jerusalem here at what we call the triumphal entry or Palm Sunday, and, he, and, and the city of Jerusalem by and large does not recognize that the king has just entered the city when they should have known that, that, that it was going to happen exa at that exact point in time because Daniel's prophecy told them that's what they should be looking for. Jesus, verse 41, And when he was come near, he beheld the city and what? wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least, in this thy, what? Day. The things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes, for the day shall come upon thee, 
<laughs> that thy enemy shall cast a trench about thee and compass thee round and keep thee in on every side and shall lay thee even with the ground and thy children within thee and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon the other. Why? Because thou knewest not what? The time of what? So when John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and the 12 apostles are now preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and the gospel of the kingdom is three things. Number one, the time is what? Fulfilled. Number two, because the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is what? At hand. The response to that, thirdly, is supposed to be repent and do what? Believe the gospel. All of these things are, that are going on are being governed by a prophetic time frame and time schedule that God laid out in the book of Daniel. So, And this is being announced to a generation in Israel that is within 10 years, give or take, of seeing all these things be what? Fulfilled. So literally when he says to them, this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled, he literally means that everybody that is listening to this preaching, according to the prophetic program, should not have and would not have died if prophecy would have gone on uninterrupted. Hopefully you're with me on that. Quickly go to back to Matthew 3. One thing I think we, I don't know if this will help or not, but it helped me. One thing we, you know, we think about the, the kingdom at hand and, and all that. Great stuff for Israel, right? But if the kingdom's at hand, something else is at hand too, okay? Because there's something that has to happen prophetically before the kingdom can what? can come in. Uh, Matthew 3, look at verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee? What? So the wrath to come is also, if the kingdom's at hand and the wrath has to happen before the kingdom, then what's also at hand? The wrath. So when you read Matthew 24, and he's talking about the beginning of sorrows and the abomination of desolation, and then at the end he talks about the second coming of Christ, and he says all these things must come to pass. Uh, this generation shall not pass, sorry, until all these things be what? Fulfilled. He's talking about the wrath and what? He's talking about the wrath of the 70th week and the tribulation period as well as the return of Christ bodily back to earth. And he's literally telling them that they're not, they're not going to taste death. They're not going to die until they see these things what? Come to pass. Come back with me to Matthew 24. <coughs> Matthew chapter 24. Again, where we started. So, it says again in verse 34... Hang on a second. Verse 34, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be what? Fulfilled. So the preterists will say, they'll say, all this already happened when? In 70 AD, so that that verse can mean what it says, and that generation not have passed before everything he's talking about has been what? Fulfilled. Okay? But the generation Christ was... But Here's the thing. Did the kingdom come? Did that generation die? So should we not trust the word of God then? So the question then is obviously what? Why? If he says, you're not going to taste death, you're not going to die till these things come to pass, and not only do they die and taste death, but it doesn't happen the way he said it was going to happen, what's, how, do, how do we answer this problem here? Okay? And my dad has said it, for, he said it all the time I was growing up, and I, I repeat it because I think it's wisdom. He says, how you answer the question of what happened to the kingdom determines everything about your theology. How you answer the question about what happened to the kingdom determines everything about your theology. Is it said to be at hand? As we'll see in a minute, is it actually offered in here in the early Acts period? But it never what? It never comes. So the answer, to tell, help explain the answer, I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about grammar. <laughs> In every language, folks, verbs possess moods. Okay? The English language possesses four verb moods. Indicative, 
imperative, subjunctive, and infinitive. Now, I'm not going to give you a whole English lesson here and tell you, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to you to, to look at what indicative, imperative, and infinitive means. The one I want to talk to you about is subjunctive, okay? In English, the subjunctive mood expresses doubt or something contrary to fact. Now, in modern English, we don't use the subjunctive, the subjunctive mood that much because we just don't talk like this anymore. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Think about this sentence. What if I say the following? If I should see him, I will tell him. Does that mean I'm automatically going to tell him? No. It means if I see him, I'll what? Tell him. But if I don't see him, I'm not going to what? I'm not going to tell him. Okay? That's an example of the sub, what's called the subjunctive verb mood in English. Well, if you start looking at the Greek language in, uh, that the New Testament was originally written in, also, the Greek language also uh, possesses four different verb moods. They are uh, indicative, optive, imperative, and subjunctive. And the subjunctive mood in Greek functions the same way that it does in English. Okay? Um, this, the subjunctive mood is the mood of probability or desirability. The action described may or may not occur depending on the circumstances. Okay? So in English, again, if I say, if I should see him, I will tell him, my telling him is, is conditioned upon the circumstance of me actually what? Seeing him, okay? Well, in the Greek, there's a similar verb mood as that that we need to make sure that we look at. Come with me back, or you should be there. Look at Matthew 24, verse 34. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. You see there the verb that is translated in English, shall not pass. You see that in, the, in your English Bible? That is coming from a Greek verb that is in the subjunctive mood, which means that that statement happening the way it's said has a condition attached to it. You guys following that? Come with me back to, come with me back if you would to, to Matthew 16. Come back to Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 28. Matthew 16, verse 28. He says, Verily I say unto you, there, shall, there, uh, there be some standing here, notice, which shall not taste of death. You see, the, you see the verb there, shall not taste, in English? You see that? That's a translation, again, of a Greek verb that is in the subjunctive mood. So them not tasting of death till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom, there's a condition in, that is attached to that. Okay? Now, you sort of, I don't want to, don't misunderstand me. It's there in English, but if you, if you look in the Greek, you, you, you can understand just a little bit more about what's going on here. He's saying that, basically what he's saying, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, according to prophecy, this will happen. But if it doesn't, what? It's not going to happen. The same is true, if you go to, uh, don't, don't turn there, just make a note of it. In my, also, the other, the other verse, the other preterist proof text, Matthew 10, 23 the Greek verb that's translated shall not have gone over in reference to all the cities of Israel is also in the subjunctive mood. So what this means, folks, is that the fulfillment of these statements is potential depending on a certain set of circumstances, okay? And I will ask you this question, what is the fulfillment of all these statements in Matthew 10, in Matthew 16, in Matthew 24? What are the circumstances that these things are contingent upon? Contingent upon whether or not Israel receives her what? Her king. Whether or not she will repent and receive her what? Her kingdom. If Israel will not and refuses to acknowledge who the Lord is, the fact that He's the King of Israel, that He's the Messiah, and in the early Acts period that they killed Him and they need to repent from that, then they will not see these things what? Come to pass. And that is the, that is the very important issue here about the subjunctive mood. It is a, these statements are true, but they are conditioned upon something. Let me show you some more things. Come to, math, come to Acts 3. Come over to Acts chapter 3.
Come over to Acts chapter 3 and look with me, at, starting at verse 12. <coughs> Acts chapter 3, verse 12. And when Peter saw it, he answered, he, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye? First of all, who's he talking to in that verse? Israel. Why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we had made, uh, we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, have glorified his son whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate uh, when he was determined to let him go. What's Israel's response to the king? Give us Barabbas. We don't want him. We want Barabbas. They're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ while he's alive and on earth there in his earthly ministry. And now here's Peter in Acts 3, after the Lord has rose again from the dead and ascended up into heaven in Acts chapter 1. He's saying to them, listen, you guys, you guys killed, and, and, and Pilate was ready to let him go, and you killed him, verse 14. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired, and desired a murderer be, to be granted unto you, verse 15, and killed who? The prince of life, whom God hath raised up from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. Verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, faith which is by him uh, hath given him this perfect soundness and presence um, of you all. And now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye wot. Ye did it as did your rulers. So is there, an, is there a problem here? What's Israel's problem? Here's the king, the kingdom's at hand, but they said what? We don't want him. And so the kingdom isn't going to come until Israel receives who? The king. And he's, they've killed him now, verse 18. But those things which God has showed by the mouth of all his holy prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath what? Now what Peter tells you is that that had to what? That had to happen. But now watch verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from what? What is Peter telling Israel to do? Repent. Change their mind about who Christ what? Is. Okay? Look at that verse again. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall what? You see the verb translated shall come? Guess what mood that verb is in? That's in the subjunctive mood. So think about that verse. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. What's the next word? When the times of refreshing shall come from what? So the times of refreshing coming in that verse are contingent upon Israel doing what? Repenting. If Israel does not repent, will the times of refreshing come? No. Look at the next verse, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. You see the verb there, he shall send? Guess what, tent, guess what mood that is in? It's subjunctive mood. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. So, folks, the times of refreshing coming and the Lord Jesus Christ being sent back to the nation of Israel are all are contingent upon that nation doing what? Repenting. And that is there in the passages. If the nation does not repent, the times of refreshing will not come and Jesus Christ will not be what? Sent. What's the answer to the preterist in Matthew 24? This generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. The issue, folks, is that there's a condition there. And the condition upon that actually occurring the way it says is dealing with the heart of that nation. And if that nation does not accept and acknowledge who Christ was, there is not going to be... The kingdom will not be sent. Verse, verse 20. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Now notice, whom the heaven what? The heavens what? Must receive. You remember, don't turn there, but you remember in Luke chapter 9, 19 that Jesus tells a parable and he talks about, a, he talks about somebody that, a king that went into a far country to receive a what? 
a kingdom. In Acts chapter 1, the Lord Jesus Christ ascends up into heaven. He goes into that far country to receive a kingdom so that when he comes back, he can bring that what? That with him. But him coming back in these passages is contingent upon the nation of Israel doing what? Repenting. The return of Christ, folks, to execute the rest of the prophetic program was contingent upon the heart attitude of the nation toward the king. If Israel would not repent, Christ would not return with the kingdom. And if Christ did not return with the kingdom, the generation that Christ was addressing in Matthew 24, 34 would certainly have passed. And did they? And did that kingdom come? No, why not? What is the answer to preterism? The answer to preterism is the fact that Israel did not repent. And when Israel did not repent, what did God do with that nation? He set them aside. And when He set them aside and He suspended prophecy, that meant that all that group that was never intended to have tasted death is now going to die because they did not repent and they rejected who? They rejected the king. Come back with me to Acts. Go to Acts 7. Get Acts 7 in in, uh, one hand as my time's winding down and Romans 11 in the other. Acts 7 and Romans chapter 11. Acts chapter 7, go to, um, you're familiar with this, Stephen is indicting the nation of Israel here. Verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, you do always resist who? You remember, what, what did Jesus say to him? He goes, I won't always be with you, but when I'm gone, I'll send you a what? A comforter. He sends the Holy Spirit upon him in Acts chapter 2. In fulfillment of the prophecy made by Joel back there in Joel chapter 2, and under the influence of the Holy Spirit, they go out there in the early Acts period and they reoffer the kingdom of that nation and the reception of it, the times of refreshing coming. The Lord Jesus Christ, who's been received up into heaven to receive a kingdom and bring it back to him and establish it, the execution of all of those things is dependent on whether or not that nation will do what? Repent. And when they don't repent, when they, when they take Stephen here being filled with the Holy Spirit and they rush upon him and they kill him and they stone him and they say, we don't want the witness of God the Holy Spirit either. We rejected God the Father in the Old Testament. We rejected God the Son in the Gospels. And here in the early Acts period, we're rejecting the Holy Spirit. There's nobody left in the Godhead for us to reject. God's only option then is to take that nation of his own forming and render them in unbelief and set them aside. And when that nation is rendered in unbelief and set aside, that generation doesn't see that because it now awaits a future fulfillment because God inserted a great parenthesis into the sentence of prophecy and temporarily suspended his prophetic dealing with Israel. Okay? That's the answer. So you come to Romans 11. Too many verses to read all of them. (laughs) Romans 11. Go first to verse 32. For God hath concluded them all in one, in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon who? God takes that nation that they don't want God the Father, the testimony of God the Father through the prophets in the Old Testament, they don't want God the Son bodily while he's on earth, they reject God the Holy Spirit, there's nothing left but for that nation to be rendered in what? Unbelief. And when that nation is rendered in unbelief and that nation is set aside and they fall and God interrupts prophecy and inserts the church age, which, which it's not an afterthought. It's been in his mind all the way before the foundation of the world, right? We, we learned about that last night. You're in, you're in Romans 11. Go to verse, verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid but rather through their what? Isn't that a weird verse? It's kind of a weird verse. Just Have they stumbled that they should what? What's the answer? God forbid or what? No, but then he says, but rather through their what? So you ever, you ever walk into a room and trip and stumble, and then later on you what? They stumble, I believe, where? At the cross. They fall, in my opinion, in Acts chapter 7 when they reject the witness of God the Holy Spirit through the preaching of Stephen and they rush upon him there with one accord and they stone him with stones. Verse 11, 
but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto who? The Gentiles, for to provoke them, that's Israel, to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak unto you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. For if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them, verse 15, for if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from what? The dead. Is God done with Israel? No. Has he temporarily set Israel aside? Yes. The answer to preterism, folks is not for you to go and say everything was fulfilled by 70 A.D. because that's the only way we can maintain the integrity of the Bible and have Jesus seemingly knowing what he's talking about. No, Jesus does know what he's talking about and he knows and understands that the reception of the kingdom and the fulfillment of that generation not dying is contingent upon that generation's attitude toward him. And when they reject him and say we don't want him, God has no other choice but to set Israel aside. That's why preterism's wrong. Preterism, like every other heresy, is not in line with the rightly divided word of God from the Pauline perspective. The answer to the preterist claims that all prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD and that we are now spiritual Israel experiencing God's spiritual kingdom is the word of God rightly divided from the mid acts Pauline perspective? That's the answer. Somebody's going to come along and try to trip you up on that. One last point. Now, we'll, I'm actually on schedule to quit early, which is a rarity at a Grace Conference. But I have one minute left, so I, I think I could probably find something to fill that time. But I'll be gracious with you all because you've been gracious with me in closing a word of prayer. Dearly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We're grateful for the saints that have gathered here this morning to hear your word preached. And we pray that there would be edification and growth from this conference, from the entire week, and from the individual studies that the men have brought. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.